comfortable little lab tech job for going out and being a faculty member and doing this if we need to do it. And I think the other thing that, because I'm a woman, I get asked to sit on panels. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I do really feel this, this thing about, I really want to educate the people that are not in this room. And they're the people that I want to talk to. And mm -hmm. I don't get invited to talk to them about mm -hmm. this because they often don't want to hear it. Mm -hmm. um, so those were my things that I'm thinking about. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. We have one last speaker. Joan, want to follow up? OK, I really, you know, I took your right all the way over, actually. But anyway, here, here goes. Um, so, um, I'm going to refer to a couple of research projects that, that I've been involved with over time. Um, so the, the Human Cloning in the Media project will come into this ever so slightly, um, but one of the other projects that I was involved with was a, a, a team of three other women at Cardiff University. And again, it's, you know, my last idea was 2008. <laughs> so, so the research was in 2008, and we were commissioned by um, an organization in Britain called the UK Resource Centre for Women in Science, Engineering, and Technology to conduct um, research on the representation of women scientists in the UK media. So that's probably mainly what I'll talk about. But also, as, as part of my research, I researched the portrayal of science and fiction. And there's a particular novel that I've thought about and not written about properly yet um, by a, a UK novelist called Gwyneth Jones called Life, which is, it's, um, it's basically it's a fictional biography of a woman bioscientist in the UK. Um, and one of the reasons I think it's that I find it really interesting, so I'm digressing, I'm mad already, forgive me, um, is that it, 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 it looks at, in the novel, it looks at kind of various levels of kind of structural inequality and, and the gendering of scientific careers, the gendering of laboratories, the gendering of the life course, kind of full stop. So this, this woman um, has, it, has it made possible to be a laboratory scientist and a mother because her male partner decides that he'll be a stay-at-home dad um, and therefore gets lots of kudos and, um, and martyr points for doing that. Um, and then, you know, and she kind of, and she experiences kind of some of what you, you've talked about in, 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 in the laboratory and um, relationships between, with, between herself and other women scientists are quite kind of raw because she, she feels that, that their role really is to mentor her. But yet, by the same t at the same time, she has investments in some of those, some of the values of kind of excellence, individuality, etc. So she's kind of she's competing with these people who she understands to be her mentors and feels let down by them. So it's it's a really interesting portrayal of kind of some of the, the barriers and the, and pressures that, that that women scientists experience. So Gwyneth Jones, who, who wrote the novel actually did her own kind of ethnographic research. She followed around a, a woman bioscientist at the University of Sussex and, um, and talked to her quite a lot about kind of the, the, the pressures that she had experienced in her career, the kind of the ambivalences that, that she experienced around kind of being a successful woman scientist. So I'd encourage you all to read that novel. Um, it's, I think it's just, it's actually for me, I think it's a really useful teaching text because it kind of, it, it takes kind of lots of institutions, the laboratory, the family, the media in fact, because um, this particular scientist is pilloried in the media because surprise, surprise, she's a woman, she's working on biology, actually she's working on the Y chromosome. <laughs> so um, she makes, um, actually she makes, it's a fictional kind of breakthrough where she discovers actually the kind of like the Y chromosome is, um, is degenerating. <laughs> oh dear, I'm just showing her um, so I'm, a kid, I'm a kid, obviously. Um, and, and that becomes kind of a media cause celebre and she's kind of, she's, in fact she's kind of, she's hounded out of her laboratory. Um, and. I am digressing a lot, so but, um, <laughs> what I really love about the novel is um, Gwyneth Jones, who's who's written the novel, is 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 very interested in kind of the history of women in science. So she's you know so she's read Box Keller's um, biography, you know, um, 
come back and I kind of talk a few of the organisms. So she draws on that. The kind of the mentor that she talks about is a very kind of Lynn Margulis like figure. So it's kind of it's, it's an interesting way to kind of to intersect with um, factual and historical knowledge is about women in science and kind of some of the pressures that they they faced. Um, so um, go ahead and read it. Um, but the, the research that we um, we did um, on the representation of UK women in science, engineering, and technology in UK media, we kind of, we we produced four reports, and if anybody's interested, I can tell you kind of where to find them online. Um, and one of the things we did was we did a combination of um, focus groups, um, interviews, um, with and some questionnaires with women at various stages of their careers in science, engineering, and technology, including um, undergraduates, including women returners, and including kind of people like Susan Greenfield, um, and one of the other top, the then head of the BBSRC, his name will come back to me. So we had kind of quite a spread um, of informants, and, and we asked them, kind of, you know, what do women in set want to see in media representations? So this was a particular task that we, we were kind of we were asked to do, we were commissioned to do. It's not necessarily the questions that I would have chosen to ask, but, but that's what the, the commission for research was about. And although concern was expressed, and as I say this is particular to the UK, so you you might tell me it's different in the US. Though they expressed concerns about the depth of media representations of women in set, it was mainly actually with regard to factual representations. Fictional representations actually were exceptions to the rule of invisibility. Um, so, you know, you know, so fictional representations that came up in the focus groups and in the group interviews were things like, um, you know, the movie Contact, um, another Jodie Foster film, which I currently forgot the name of, which is when a plane is hijacked and she kind of runs around kind of doing things, kind of engineering behind the scenes. And of course, all the forensic dramas, um, Silent Witness in the UK, the various CSIs, um, and Bones. So, in, in, you know, so we have fictional representations of women doing quite nicely in set, in very particular sectors, but that, that wasn't in the UK borne out in factual representations. Concerns were expressed about stereotypical representations of women's science, and they fell kind of into two camps. So there were either the kind of like the dowdy, socially, socially isolated and over-emotional scientist women who clearly failed to swim, or clearly failed to swim. That's an inverted commas if it wasn't clear. Or there were the, the you know the kind of the socially adept, kind of blonde, well-groomed scientists who clearly were failing as scientists because you know can possibly be attractive and be a scientist. And this, this, some of this feedback is feedback that we're getting from, from kind of women scientists themselves. So two of my colleagues um, have written an article called Bimbles and Balkans, <laughs> which I encourage you to look at, kind of to, to, to see the ways in which, I mean, Donna Haraway has said, you know, a feminist scientist, uh, sorry, a female scientist is an oxymoron. <laughs> and those two terms are really hard to hold together. Um, and. There was quite a lot of debate in our focus groups about the extent to which media representations about women in, in science, engineering, and technology should be realistic or aspirational. And, and there, was, there, was a, there was a debate and kind of disagreement around that. So, you know, some of the, the women said, well, you know, it's fair enough that in, the, in like the press stories about women in science, you only get one female scientist quoted to every um, five male scientists because that, actually that's an overrepresentation um, it's because there's 13 percent of women in set in the career force in the uk so you know kind of a, 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 a higher representation would be unrealistic you know it would be giving people the idea that there are more women in science than there actually are um, and not fully um, representing the challenges that there are um, some of them thought that, some of our, our interviewees and folks group members thought that, that, that we should, that media represent, representations should talk about the difficulty of being a, a kind of like a woman in a man's world and talk about the issues of, of parenting, of, of being a mum and a scientist. And some were just like, no, just don't go there. Um, for a start, we want to be recognised as scientists, not female scientists. 
Um, and you know, and we don't want to put people off. Um, and if, if you know, if you talk about kind of all these challenges, um, then that might be, you know, that might be um, kind of, you know, an unintended but kind of not unexpected consequence that that, that young women are put off um, going into these careers. So, so kind of, and talking to them, kind of what they were asking for. In, in terms of the media, I mean, and, and because we were again we were tasked with making recommendations to to the, the, this council, the, the UKRC, and also to, to media producers. I mean, and, and what it came down to was that that we needed more, but more diverse representations of women scientists um, and and of scientific careers, because as I say, you know, all women in say can't be forensic psychologists or you know. Um, or work in CSI labs. Um, surely there's, there's more to be done. Um, in the media representations, they wanted routine acknowledgement of set as a field for women. So, so they were talking about, it's all very well having these science focused dramas, but in soap operas, can't one of the women just be a scientist, kind of in passing? You know, in, in Friends, this was what somebody said, you know, you've got a male paleontologist um, somebody who works in IT, and then you've got the idiot actor, obviously. Um, but the women are a masseur, masseurs, a caterer, and somebody who works in fashion. Why couldn't one of them be a scientist, for example? Um, how, how am I doing for time? Um, maybe wrapping up. So right, wrapping up, okay, that's fine. So just a few things then. Um, so one of the things that they were keen to see was kind of promotion of set in what they called less macho ways. So showing kind of different motivations for entering science so that not necessarily all about being kind of Nobel Prize winning or kind of excellence, excellence mm -hmm. all the way, that, that it might be about wanting to, you know, okay, the values of curiosity, but wanting to solve, solve social problems and wanting to be part of a team. They were, they were very keen that people working in science weren't always represented as uber confident. They wanted there to be place in science and in representations of science for people who were less confident, who who just wanted to do kind of a, a, a job that was kind of meaningful and fulfilling. Um, yeah, I think I think that's I think everything else I've kind of covered already. But as I say, can this ambivalence about whether representation should be aspirational um, or realistic was a, was a very key tension. And the issue of whether women scientists should be represented as women scientists was another key tension. Could you not just be a scientist who happened to be a woman or a woman who happened to be a scientist? Did they have to be kind of tied in this way that always makes the subjectivity problematic? Thank you very much, John. I would like to open up the floor for uh, questions, or should, should we break now and come back? Why don't we take a few, few comments and, and then, then oh, okay. right, let's do yeah. that. Yeah. Let's see yours that we want to talk about. I have a question. Okay. So, um, um, let me just interrupt just for a second. Let's sure. Just ask you guys to introduce yourselves, please. Okay. Sure. Um, I'm Angie Wolfgang. I'm a fifth year grad in astronomy. Um, so, uh, we've had, I've had a couple conversations in the past with past grad students, other colleagues at other institutions, um, about the privilege is issue and affirmative action. And um, and the debate usually goes, well, you, in a, a applying affirmative action, or whatever you want to call it, you're discriminating against the white man. Um, <laughs> and so, in thinking about this and how to respond to it, um, I have kind of settled on bringing up the idea of unconscious bias. But these are scientists that we're talking to, and so and this is a social science construct. Um, and so there's a tendency to kind of just slough it off. So my question is, is there a central clearinghouse of studies about unconscious bias and affirmative action that I can actually have hard data mm -hmm. to bring up this this point of you're a scientist, we can test this idea, and it's a real thing. Mm -hmm. Can I? So, so um, 
<coughs> the way that affirmative action works in employment, and everybody who gets federal money <coughs> has to be an affirmative action employer, is that you match basically utilization against availability. So if if you expect out of, if you're looking at a nationally published uh, record that all employers and universities use, if the number of astrophysicists produced today of 30% um, women, and in the past it was 10% women, you're not going to fire your tenured professors to, because um, that would be illegal, to, to replace them, but you can calculate pretty easily what your rate should be if absence discrimination. And basically your utilization, that is the people you hire should, assuming that people stay in their jobs a long time, match availability over the, um, factored over the years. When your utilization and availability are 10% out of whack, you are um, meant to, according to affirmative action, you are meant to look at your own processes and say, oh my goodness, have we introduced something in that we didn't mean to introduce that is somehow excluding women? And, you're, and you are supposed to do this with certain designated um, ethnic groups too. African Americans, Latino Americans, Native Americans, and Asian Americans. So the only group that you don't have to worry about if they're underrepresented is is the group called white males. So you could say, well, that's a form of discrimination that you don't look out for them. But of course, historically, white males have, have done fine. So it's very, very, very numbers-based. You don't go on a witch hunt. You don't, try, you know, and then, but then when you're looking and you say, oh, well, we didn't have any women on the hiring committee, for example. That was one that a lot of places have turned up. Uh, and so there, in fact, there are a lot of studies that have been done I'll be happy to give you references afterwards, showing that affirmative action, when when it, when a employer has affirmative action, in this narrow sense of matching utilization and availability, that in fact they often, in the studies that have been done on this, they often end up being more profitable, for example, similar to your patent idea. So it makes good economic sense, it makes good social sense, and it's not based on being warm and fuzzy. Now, one of the things that could be that could work with individuals is to have them take the IAT, Mazarin Banaji's. Um, it's sometimes called the Harvard test. It's sometimes called the Implicit Association test. And you could take it on a whole number of different dimensions. And it's amazing how we can see the extent to which we think certain things go together. So that when you think things go together, you respond more rapidly in milliseconds than when you think things don't go together, mm -hmm. when you're sort of surprised by an association. Mm -hmm. But I, I think probably in industry... Well, if you... Um, we'll hook up later and I'll get your email address and I can have our director of research point you to the unconscious bias body of work. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so that yeah, you basically, happen. yeah, I mean, so I've, I've heard, like, people say, refer to different studies, like the resume study, um, that kind of thing. Yeah. But it, I, I'm looking kind of like for a central clearinghouse. Well, I, I'll, I'll have her send that to you, but there's also, a, we have a sister organization called NCWIT, the National Center of Women in Information Technology. They were both, uh, my boss was a founder, so my boss the CEO, Anita Borg, was the co-founder of both. And um, they, NCWIT, was really put together to be a clearinghouse that all of the groups working on this issue of women in computing, which is really our focus, um, were, there were all these disparate efforts, and so the NSF funded NCWIT to be the umbrella organization um, for this movement, and they also have, you know, compared to our one social scientist, they have five social scientists. Um, they have great resources on their website, and they've also turned their resources into really practical things, like a 10-point reference card on how to talk to people about unconscious bias or whatever. So there's a ton of resources at their site that are really useful. We have a hand up over there. Well, I was just gonna say that they have a site called Project Implicit. And the, and the site you're talking about probably is more 
kind of a combination of materials which would be really helpful, but if you want to just go straight to the Harvard studies. Yeah, I've, I've actually done different. a couple of those. I was yeah. aware of that, um, yeah. but I didn't know of like a list of like social science studies. Oh, well, if you look at Banaji's website too, then she's got all the studies that she's an author on, and there's quite a few. So maybe with all these, this would be useful. Yeah, and then also I'd be happy to share my own personal story, because when, um, the Prop 209 thing was going on, I went out and spoke because I just thought people had stereotypes about people who benefited from affirmative action. And I, you know, came of age in college when affirmative action was not a bad word. And it had a very specific purpose. Um, and so I tell you my story because sometimes with people, it's like you don't want to kill them with PowerPoint, you want to tell them something yeah. that touches their heart, which is, you know, you know a real person who really deserves a, an equal chance and here's what affirmative action did for them. No, never meant that they were lowering their standards let me in. It just meant my dad didn't have a connection for an internship that summer. <laughs> I sometimes think also I've had students say, you know, where's the, the white male fellowship? We have all these fellowships. And, and my response often is, well, would you like to trade places with that person that you think is taking your money from you? Mm -hmm. Like they've grown up, like they grow up and mm -hmm. have grown up with the pressures and and what they have, and immediately they can step back and go, yeah, actually, I know what the problems are, and no, I don't want to deal with it. <laughs> so, as to call, call on a couple of those, the affirmative part of affirmative action, when you're taking action, you're getting up out of your chair to take action, it doesn't mean that you're lowering your standards, it means that you are working harder to get somebody. And I'll give you an example. I taught for 13 years at Smith College, Women's College on the East Coast, and we kept trying to hire black um, psychologists to come and be in this little town of Northampton mm -hmm. where they could never get their hair done mm -hmm. and there were no other black people anywhere and so on. Mm -hmm. And my colleague said, my colleagues at one point said, well see, we just, you know, we weren't going to lower our standards and thank goodness we didn't lower any standards. But I was already working on affirmative action I said, you know, I think what we need to do is to be affirmatively going out of our way to make connections. So at the next national meeting of American Psychological Association, I went to about 25 talks that I thought might, by the title of the talk, might have a, a black psychologist giving the talk. Mm -hmm. And I, I graded them, you know? And then I went for those five stars. I made personal contact. I took them out for drinks, mm -hmm. had a great time. They, all five of them, applied for the job. One of them dropped out, this is, a, this is the fourth year of us trying to get somebody where the, the white guys were saying, hey, there isn't anybody out there. And I was saying, yeah, there is. They just don't like us. <laughs> and, and so it was, I didn't make that effort to go get a white guy to, to apply. I made the extra effort. Smith College paid for all those drinks, all those dinners where I was trying to lose somebody. And then we ended up hiring. We had... We had people who were just as good, better than other candidates when we hired, and it really was a revelation for people to say, wait a minute, it's just that we hadn't made the appropriate effort. So affirmative in the sense of going out of your way to give a scholarship, to go find people, to make yourself attractive. Or go beyond be, your social network, go your beyond, natural social network. And go beyond your comfort zone sometimes mm -hmm. too. You know? the, you know, so that's affirmative. I know a guy with binders of women. <laughs> so maybe we should um, take a break, have some food, think about what you want to discuss in the second half of a half discussion. Um, and we'll come back in about 10 minutes or so. So thank you to all the speakers. We can bring in the food. Yeah. Have a good here.